All right, Michael, Misha, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me about Snatched. Yeah. Thanks, Denny. So, Michael, you've said that you found inspiration for the, the short this past spring after reading statements in regards to the, uh, the Don't Say Gay bill. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, that's the Parental Rights and Education Act, uh, which is commonly referred to as the Don't Say Gay Bill. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of empty statements put out by corporate leaders, business leaders, politicians, um, affirming their commitment to LGBTQ plus employees, friends, family, while supporting measures that um, harm them. Uh, and I was so struck by that discordance. I was so struck by um, how hollow these statements were. And um, it, it just started that day. Uh, I turned to my partner and I said, gosh, wouldn't it be funny if a kid came out as gay to his parents in a horror movie? But the horror is that they're over enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't stop giggling about that, just, just that one line. And then from there, you know, we started recognizing all the ways we could both sort of subvert the expectations of, of a coming out story, but, as, but horror tropes as well. Mm -hmm. um, to sort of show the kind of upside down world we're living in these days. And, you know, the body snatchers mythology going back to 1956, which was an allegory for McCarthyism in the seventies, it was post Vietnam. Every 10 to 15 years, this story sort of makes a mark in the culture to reflect the times. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had a pretty juicy allegory for identity politics um, yeah. and, and it just poured out. For sure. Great. Awesome. And Misha, why did you want to be involved with this project? And what was the experience like for you? What, what an easy question. No, um, it's funnily enough, I said this in an interview ages ago, and I realized that I really meant it. Um, Michael's script really did that thing left off the page, but in like a legit way. Um, it was so fun to read. It was so snappy. I come from the horror world. That's where most of my professional career has been. Mm -hmm. So to read something that in 10 pages 12 pages Michael seven what is it seven pages seven pages yeah. in seven pages you went on a full-ass journey can I, I can curse right I'm gonna yes curse. go ahead <laughs> um, we went on a full-ass journey it was fully realized characters it was horror it was camp it was funny I, it was I was genuinely impressed with the horror comedy muscle flexing that this one was doing mm -hmm. um but uh, other than that, it's the I wasn't shocked, but it was like a pleasant reaffirmation of his abilities. Like we were on set and, you know, when you're shooting a short film, it's such murder. Like you are you are there for four or five days max. You're getting shit done. You have no time to think, no time to breathe. And somehow Michael maintained composure. Everybody felt like a family on set. We had family meals. It I felt and I think everybody felt like we had an opportunity to make something great, even in the rush of making a short film on set. So. From start to finish, it was a really uh, kind of a no-brainer process. Yeah. Awesome. And Michael, what made Misha write for the role of Joey? Uh, Joey? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And it's the first time I'm being asked that with Misha present. <laughs> uh, so Misha knows this, I believe. I think I talked to Misha about this. Um, I wrote this film in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote it in that initial 15 minutes, I wrote the character of Joey as a blonde cis golden boy okay and um because i thought that was the way to subvert expectations and i quickly recognized and questioned why i thought that why did this character need to look like that archetype that we've seen before and Misha and I had been circling around each other for a while. Um, I was a big fan of Misha's work. Freaky knocked my socks off last year. And when I thought about Misha and I thought about Misha for this role, I recognized that actually Misha's uniqueness, both as a, as a performer, but also as a person, brings uh, new shades and coloring and nuances to this character that to me are much more valuable in the messaging that we're trying to get across, uh, especially because, you know, you have a very short time to communicate characters. Yeah. And the beginning of the script in the coming out scene, Joey very specifically says, I think I'm gay. Mm -hmm. It is not a deliberate mom, I'm gay coming out scene. And that was intentional because most of the coming out scenes that I've seen throughout my life um, are very binary, funny enough. 
it's I'm I'm coming out as gay, or I'm or uh, or it's someone reaffirming their heterosexuality, and there's no space for me, especially for a young person, a young character, to still investigate what their identity might be. Maybe they'll be gay, but maybe they won't be. Maybe they'll be bisexual. Maybe they'll be pansexual. Maybe they're exploring their gender. Mm -hmm. And if I intrinsically knew that I wanted to create a character who who had the bandwidth to continue to explore their identity, um, Misha uh, allowed that opportunity to, I think, diversify that question. Okay. Broaden it. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that that was beautiful. Um, and, you know, uh, I, lo I love telling the story. M Misha is a non-binary performer. The first question I asked Misha was, are, are, do you feel comfortable playing a cis character? Mm -hmm. Because I do think the character should still be cis. And Misha goes, uh, honey, I'm an actor. <laughs> 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 it was like something to that effect. Yeah. And it was so beautiful. <laughs> I'm so I'm sorry to embarrass you. <laughs> I just I didn't I didn't know where the story was going. I'm like, what would I have said to that? It was, it was something properly sassy. So okay, that's me. But but what I loved about that is Misha immediately became a collaborator in this film, and that's all. I only want to work with collaborators. I'm not the head of the set making all the decisions. I want to be able to pull the creativity out of my collaborators, and Misha was completely game for that. Cool. Um, so anyway, it was a luxury to have Misha involved, and I think Misha brought so much to that character in such a short amount of time, most importantly, regardless of identity um that you root for misha you you see misha at the beginning of the film and you root for them and that was the most important thing for me awesome fantastic and snatched is one of 20 new short form episodes in the third season of hulu's bite Size halloween how has it been received by audiences yeah i mean I'm very well <laughs> 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 I, I'm hearing well. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I've never heard of the program before. And then looking back on it, first of all, previous shorts and previous seasons were mm -hmm. um, uh, very well liked and followed in the horror community and mm -hmm. online. And then this season, it seems like everything has just been ramped up. Um, I'm, I'm hearing well. I'm hearing good things. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... Um, I'm so happy that it's provoked conversation as it should, right? M my goal as a filmmaker um, is not to give you the answers. It's simply to ask you the questions. Yeah. And I think we have uh, told a story that uh, incites conversation. I mean, the, the wildest thing about it was when I sat down to write it, part of the joke was how many queer references can I get these straight characters to, you know, trot out as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and that's why that kitchen scene literally every line is a joke and it's very purposeful because it's meant to disarm you right you're supposed to laugh and think everything's sort of funny and fun so that when the ending comes it really punches you in the gut mm -hmm. um and there was this TikTok that went viral that's almost at three million views now which is i was, I was just gonna bring it up i was just gonna bring it up it's so wild to me and what's interesting about it denny is that this amazing 20 year old girl in australia basically posted a TikTok of her watching the kitchen scene and just laughing her ass off <laughs> and there's thousands and thousands of comments and what was interesting in one of the last interviews i did um, I was asked, well, how do I feel that all people seem to, you know, from a from a large public standpoint, know about it is the comedic elements of it, mm -hmm. that it just seems like a farce, a, a, a campy comedy. What about the horror underneath? What about the real issues underneath? Yeah. And I thought that was interesting. But also, um, again, it's meant to disarm you. So if you laugh, right, laughter is a, is a great equalizer. If you laugh and then you check out this film. My guess is you're expecting something, ins you know, insanely over the top and silly yeah. that hopefully the end will hit you even harder. Um, and, you know, a spoonful of sugar makes a medicine go down. It's easy to uh, hook someone with a laugh first yeah. and then make them question not only what they've seen previously, but why they were laughing to begin with. Mm -hmm, definitely, for sure. And although it is a comedy, it is a horror as well. Why do you think LGBTQ people resonate with the horror genre so well? 
I'll let Misha take that first, since Misha was just on the Queer for Fear series on Shudder and AMC talking okay. about this very thing. So Misha, I hand it to you. I was, I was. I hope I sound as smart as I did that day. Um, <laughs> no, but, and also, I mean, not for nothing, I, I was telling Michael at the top of this, I'm also a guest judge on another Shudder series. I'm a guest judge on Dragula, the okay. second row. I was just at the premiere last night. And queer people, look, I've always viewed queerness as a superpower that I probably didn't get that tattooed on me at some point. Um, but queerness as a superpower in that instead of being othered in a bad way, instead of feeling on the outside of society in a way that makes us feel shame or loss, we celebrate being in the other. I celebrate my, you know, my non-binariness. I celebrate my gender fluidity. I know so many people in the trans and non-binary community do the same and the whole LGBTQIA plus community do the same. That act of celebration means that we're celebrating stuff that's outside of the norm. Horror is inherently pushing the edges of what's normal and it's pushing the edges of what we would normally see on a traditional TV screen or traditional any, you know, entertainment. So things like Dracula, where the drag artists are like all like sort of like done up in like crazy, scary, spooky, bloody things, or things like the Queer for Fear doc, where we're talking about how queerness has woven its way through the entertainment industry. Queerness is kind of the, queerness and horror is often one and the same because we're celebrating the extremes and celebrating being on kind of the fringes of society because it's it's fun here. That, I know that's a bit of like a long take, but that's very much what I believe. Yeah, for sure, definitely. And my well, and, uh, Misha, I was just going to say something I was astounded by. I've watched the first three episodes of Queer for Fear was, you know, Mary Shelley is often considered to be perhaps one of the inventors of horror and sci-fi with Frankenstein. Mary Shelley was bisexual. Uh, it's thought Bram Stoker was queer. James Whale, who directed all those films in the early 20th century, was queer. Um, it's astounding to me how many of the early icons of horror were queer storytellers themselves. Yeah. And even if, you know, Hitchcock didn't identify as queer, the fact that you look at Strangers on a Train, you look at Rope, you look at all those, I mean, it was just so prevalent. Mm -hmm. And an interesting conversation I've been having lately is um, regarding, oh, the new interview with the Vampire series. Have you watched it yeah. yet? I've seen I, am, it for I haven't seen it yet, no. Well, I'm not, <laughs> we're not here to talk interview with the Vampire, but really quickly, what's fascinating about it to me is subtext is, has become text. So you read those early Anne Rice novels, um, you know, to a queer person, uh, uh, Louis and Lestat are, are inherently in a queer relationship. Um, but it was always, especially obviously with the Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise film, you know, it was subtext. It was not overt. And now it's completely overt. They're levitating and having sex all the live long day. And I immediately thought, God, I sort of miss when it was coded. <laughs> I sort of miss when it was like a little dangerous. And my partner said to me, like, what a luxury that you feel that way. Like, how amazing that it can become text now. And I think that says something a little bit about, I mean, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, filing for AARP anytime soon. But but I am a, a different generation mm -hmm. than uh, than Gen Z um, and the TikTok generation. And you know, it's interesting to me that from my vantage point, I sort of miss the codedness. And I'm sure a 16 year old queer kid would say to me, like, come on, like, get with yeah. it. Now, mm -hmm. now we are mainstream. Of course, though, the word queer inherently means not mainstream. So what happens when queer goes mainstream, which is perhaps a read you could make of Snatched as well, mm -hmm. is what are the ramifications of queerness going mainstream, which I think is a worthy conversation. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And Snatched is also now available on Disney, making it the first queer horror comedy Disney has ever produced. How significant is, real? is that? Is that a real thing? I think it might be. I think so. I believe so, cool. yeah. <laughs> like how significant uh, is that i mean really yeah you know 20th digital studio is the arm that produced bite Size halloween uh and they are owned by disney and you know i think it's um it's interesting i think there have been queer characters certainly in disney produced films i'm not just talking about the animated films of course mm -hmm. but to sort of under the largest media company in the world create something that is queer horror comedy and and um 
uh, as sort of, I don't know, a little bit risque. I mean, what, you know, in the YouTube version, we had to cut a few moments, which I don't need to get into, <laughs> but um, it was a little too risque. So, but you know, we're, we're pushing those boundaries. And yeah. I think that's our job as artists, right? Is, is Definitely. to um, put it in front of people, you know, look, I've watched this with my parents, with my in-laws, you know, it's amazing the conversations it has provoked across generational divides, gender divides, sexuality divides. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the most important thing is if we can have those conversations amongst disparate groups of people, perhaps we can find uh, some greater love and respect and compassion. Yes, definitely. Now, any thoughts of turning Snatch into a full length film or a miniseries? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Miniseries. So I like that, like a limited series. Fine. That's fun. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think, um, look, I when I had to pitch it, I had to pitch both the short film and what I would do with the longer form story. So so I, I know what that longer form story would be. Um, it, obviously, there's precedent for body snatcher stories, right? So we know it can fill a two hour movie. Um, but it's actually interesting you say that about limited series, because very intentionally, my hope by the end of the film was to hint at a greater conversation beyond virtue signaling and inclusion of the LGBTQ plus community, but, uh, but in a broader sense, which is why in the car scene, there's a, a, Jew, a, a proper Jewish joke, uh, as well as, you know, uh, Leon saying he can't make dinner for Juneteenth. And then we cut back to Tatiana wearing a kente stole is, I think there's a lot of stories we can tell about a neighborhood yeah. made up of a diverse, you know, diverse families and sort of look and examine the ways in which we can be more meaningful allies to one another. So, you know, yeah. I, and also like uh, Misha has the fountain of youth apparently in their backyard, but I'm hoping we can make this project with Misha before they turn 50, maybe before. <laughs> I guess by then Misha, you could be one of the parents. <laughs> You've just revealed that I'm actually 37 and I hate you. <laughs> Not thirty-seven. Um, no, it's I. It's fun. Funnily enough, Michael. More and more now that people see this short, I'm not joking. You even the, the one of the EPs of Dragula last night. We were talking about this. Um, Snatch as a feature has people guessing about what it's going to be because. I even Michael. I don't even know like the actual like roadmap that you've laid out. You and I have only lightly discussed it, but the people actually are curious about what would this be as a feature because there's a few directions you could take and most every time somebody starts a conversation with me I just sit back and listen and every time it's different every time somebody has a new exciting way that they could see this as a feature which to me tells the very clear story that yes people do want to see more of this so mm. fuck yeah do it. yeah you can be people yeah. guessing yes yes so, and the, the team for Snatch uh, was full of LGBTQ plus creatives women and people of color how beneficial was that? How beneficial was that? Mm -hmm. It's the only way I work, to be okay. honest. Good. Um, I mean, every project I ever do is majority queer women, people of okay. color, um, which is not uh, in totality, right? I, I, to me, that's the point of inclusion. Is yeah. I, do, I do want straight white cis guys on set as well. I don't want to completely eliminate them uh, from the conversation. But yeah, you know. Um, Nilu Safinya, our producer, is an Iranian woman. Um, uh, our um, costume designer was a queer man of color. Our production designer was queer. Our, you know, I met our editor we, last night. Oh, yeah, Misha. Oh, my God, that made me so happy. Yeah. Misha met our editor. You know, you don't get to really? meet post-production and actors don't necessarily yeah. ever get to meet. So um, our editor, Mike Patterson-Pack, who I've been a huge fan of for years, um, is a queer man as well. So... Yeah, you know, I think um, oftentimes people want a story of a historically oppressed group to reflect their own story. Exactly. And the truth is there is such a multitude of stories within any historically oppressed group. And so, like, even when I look at the TikTok comments, I've seen people say, like, oh, my God, like, that would never happen to me. And then I've heard, uh, or, like, I've never, this is this is farcical, like this would never happen. And then I see multiple people say, this is exactly what happened to me. 
And then I have like wild other comments, uh, you know, which I don't need to get into, but, but that show the diversity of experience here, right? Mm -hmm. So to have other types of queer artists on set, women, people of color, all people who can sort of speak to this greater story, um, I think only informs and deepens the story we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm, for sure, definitely. Well, how can one stay up to date with Snatched? Oh, uh, they can, um, they can follow Misha and I on, uh, on the socials. Uh, I'm at Boat Ashore, Misha. I'm Misha Oshirovich, it's I'm the only one in existence. So, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, we, we've submitted to a few festivals. We'll find out about that in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, and hopefully there will continue to be more news to share soon. Awesome, fantastic. Then before before we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to mention? Or are either of you working on any other projects you would like to plug? Sure, Misha. Anything? Fuck you. Um, I, <laughs> you have to bleep that. I'm sorry. Um, I, <laughs> oh, I'm, I, I, I'm yeah, totally keeping that in. <laughs> incredible. I, I am so, I, I got to say, I'll, I'll speak holistically. I'm so grateful and blessed and happy that the horror, the queer horror community in Hollywood has really embraced me. And mm. I've been able to move quite a few things forward as a producer and writer um, mm -hmm. that I'm, you know, work, working on literally later today. And as Michael knows yesterday, which is why we had to reschedule this. Um, so I'm, I'm pitching a lot. I'm writing a lot. I'm really grateful on that front. So more to come on that, but yes, I have just been informed that there are some horror acting moments that are happening for me next year. So that'll be exciting as well. I, it's a non-answer, but I'm very excited. <laughs> Perfect. So excited. Michael. Yeah, you know, it's it's the same thing. Misha and I are both uh, multidisciplinary creatives. We like to tell stories in different ways, in different roles, different mediums. I think it keeps it exciting. Um, I just finished writing my first novel uh, yeah. and have a few TV shows that I'm pitching. And then, you know, I'd love to get going. I think winter is the best time to write. Definitely. You know, the sun goes down early. Not as many people are distracting you trying to hang out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited to get going on the greater Snatch story uh, very soon. Awesome. Fantastic.